as I go, I will cover the road, uh, why the road was so significant. I'll talk about its route, where it ran. Um, I'll give you some detail on a few of the sites and some of the incidents and the people along the way. Uh, also, I'll also speak to what happened to it. And I'll follow up or finish up with a bit about the Boonslick Road Association, particularly as a source of more information about this topic. The Boonslick Road was, was not just a uh, Missouri road, it was not just a local Missouri road. Uh, my main objective today is to show the origins of what was and still is one of America's most traveled east-west corridors. It cut into the heart of the newly opened Louisiana Purchase and provided the way for Oberlin travel, roughly paralleling the Missouri River into this vast new territory and eventually to Santa Fe and beyond. The Boone's Lick and the road that was developed to it jump-started the opening of the West, especially after uh, about 1816. While I'm going to be focusing on the road and overland travel, it was really the geography of the lower Missouri River Valley that drove the exploitation of the West. River exploration had been going on for many decades uh, using the obvious main route into the, our continent's uh, heartland. But east-west travel to the north or the south of the Missouri River Valley uh, developed much, much more slowly. So it was focused here on the, on the lower Missouri River Valley. Since Boone's Lick is in the name of this road, I don't want to assume that everyone knows exactly where it is. And while I go into more detail later to get really specific, I wanted to show its location in central Missouri in the southwest corner of uh, present-day uh, Howard uh, County. The salty waters of what became the Boone's Lick of course were known to Native Americans uh, in the area prior to any European encroachment, but James Mackay was the first to claim it under the European system of private ownership. Mackay had led an expedition up the Missouri River for the Spanish in 1795, and part of his reward was a grant of land, uh, what he surveyed later as Mackay's Lick and what became still later more widely known as Boone's Lick. The Boone brothers, Nathan and Daniel Morgan, never owned that lick, but they instead worked out a deal with Mackay to use the land to begin a salt extraction operation. Of great historical interest here is the actual survey done for, for James Mackay showing his property boundaries and the location of the Boone's Lick. Here's a perfect example that I wanted to point out of the value of our state archives. <clears throat> when I was made aware of this survey by Lynn Morrow, a Boone's Lake Road Association board member and former director of the local records program here at the Missouri State Archives, I only had an image of the survey. I wanted the source document. A simple email and a call to the archives uh, resulted in learning that the survey image was uh, part of a larger survey document and that there was an accompanying document uh, that I had never even expected that gave the land board's reasons for finally uh, granting ownership of this contested parcel to the Mackay estate. For a nominal fee I soon had in my inbox high resolution copies of both documents that gave us much more information. And both of those documents are now on our Boone's Lake Road Association website so that others can use them in their own research. And I'll talk more about that library later and how you can access it. On the left, you see here a map of the Boone's Lake State Historic Site uh, located in southwest Howard County, a few miles northwest of the start of the San what's considered the start of the Santa Fe Trail. On the right is a diorama depiction of one of the several salt evaporation furnaces 
established by the Boones beginning in 1805. I'd like to add another pitch for this state historic site. Uh, if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it for a short visit if you're anywhere close. The site has several interpretive panels, uh, but is only minimally developed, which I think is very appropriate for a site of this type. You really get a sense of the salt making operation from a short visit here. This slide was adapted from a 1932 atlas uh, by Charles Paulin and John Wright and shows dramatically how the new Americans moved once they were able to push across the Mississippi River. By the time of the 1820 census on which this uh, graph graphic is based, the importance of the lower Missouri River Valley to the opening of the West should be obvious. That's where the people were and as far inland as present Howard County and a bit beyond. So where was the Boone's Lake Road? Nathan and Daniel Morgan Boone, as I mentioned, began working the Salt Lake on land owned by James Mackay in 1805. They could ship their dried salt uh, to market using hollowed out logs or uh, flat boats uh, floating them down the river, but they certainly had to make some trips overland with supplies uh, from the area of their home in the uh, Femme Osage Valley uh, southwest of St. Charles. Unfortunately, we have no record of those overland trips. But we do have a wonderful early record from the 1808 journal of the famed William Clark as he and a unit of dragoons were guided by Nathan Boone from St. Charles, past the Boone's Lick, and on to the site where they accomplished their mission of building Fort Osage, or Fort Clark. In this account, Clark does not mention that they were traveling on a named road, or a named trail, but it's clear from analysis that they followed the general course of what would become known as the Boone's Lick Road. For example, we have here his entry from August 29, 1808, as they approached Cedar Creek, the eastern boundary of now Boone County. And again, I realize you may not be able to read uh, these uh, on this presentation, but they're available uh, online at our library and online from uh, the uh, uh, Facebook uh, site, or the, I guess, John from the... It's on our website. Uh, on, on the archives website. Uh, tonight, or any other time you want to look at it, or tonight, I guess. Um, this account mentions uh, the Muddy River, which is the Avaz uh, Creek. It also mentions uh, the Birch Fork of the Cedar Creek. They spelled it S W E D E R. Mentioned the uh, the Percy Creek, which is in uh, western uh, Boone County, and it also goes on to mention Monotaw River, which uh, forms part of the boundary between Boone and Howard counties. So you can follow Clark's uh, route using uh, this description. But here we see a, a pretty educated estimate, or a highly educated estimate of that route using Clark's notes um, and some survey, surveyor's notes. This was done by James Harlan, a geographer at the University of Missouri. Harlan is an expert on the terrain of Missouri and has critically studied these notes and used the water courses and distances and the terrain from Clark's journal to give his interpretation of the, of the route that Boone uh, guided uh, William Clark over for this trek. It turns out that the 1808 trek to Fort Osage was clearly setting the course for the later road. Um, it may well have incorporated existing Indian trails. Uh, in part, although we don't have good records of that. This, uh, uh, this uh, map was created by James Denny, and it sort of shows the wider context uh, of the Boonslick Road and its continuation on to Fort Osage in western Missouri. I'd like to point out again, this is a good place to emphasize the importance of the corridor effect, as I call it, of the lower Missouri River Valley. 
The Missouri River was the obvious, logical place to begin exploring and, and exploiting the Louisiana Purchase. Early expeditions went up the river well before Lewis and Clark in 1804, but once the Lick, the Boone's Lick came into the public conscience in the first decade of the 1800s, an overland route to that part of central Missouri was obviously needed. It roughly paralleled the Missouri River even as far as later independence. Remembering the population density map from the 1820 census, a powerful argument could be made. I think that the, that the same development would have occurred even if the Boone brothers had not exploited the Salt Lake that took their name, uh, though maybe a bit more slowly. The Boone family name certainly had a cachet to it, but the geography of that river, cor of that river corridor, dictated where people could most easily exploit the new territory. William Clark's uh, journal is not detailed enough to pinpoint the route at the local level at that early time. And the road that became more traveled and well-known probably did not follow Boone's route in detail anyway. Some have written that Nathan Boone himself surveyed the Boone's Lake Road. He certainly would have been a natural to have done that. He had the surveying skills and he was out there and he knew the route but no such survey has ever been found. So we have to use other means to accurately reconstruct the route. Fortunately, it's not long before we have other records that do allow us to plot the earliest Boone's Lake Road with some precision. And I'm referring to the year of about 1820 when these two publications came out based on data from about that time. They came out 22 and 23, I believe it was, uh, but the data, because of the time lag, was closer to 1820, maybe 1821. Um, and if we can pinpoint these waypoints, then we're a long way towards mapping the road at that time. Uh, if you have a chance to look at these waypoints, you'll see many times they agree uh, with the names. Other times new ones were added or different ones were used. Uh, by the two different uh, gazetteers. The total distances, in fact, the individual distances between points are quite uh, consistent. So these are two key source documents for uh, mapping the uh, early route of the Boone's Lake Road. But when you get to details uh, of this first route and the other routes, what I call the Alpha Boone's Lake Road, uh, these are available as a Google map online from the Boone's Lake Road Association's homepage at boonslakeroad.org. This overall map also shows the original route and its major variations created in the 1820s. Both of these caused by the designation of county seats first in Boone County when Boone was formed and then in Callaway County. Each one of those uh, county formations caused a variation in the road. The original alpha, or the original, or what I call the alpha route, um, preceded these sites, uh, but you couldn't have a county seat that really was not on the main road. The, the uh, powers that be were not going to let that happen. So new routes were established to supersede the original one over time. If you access the Google map, you can see the current best detailed research using either the roadmap view or the satellite view. I've shown you the roadmap view here. I would, though, though like to also stress that every detail, every change in local variation in an early road like this cannot be precisely determined through its entire uh, development. Uh, we are still occasionally learning things to make some adjustments in these, and uh, that process will probably uh, continue for some time. Before mentioning some of the stops and some of the stories from along the road, it's important to remember that two major groups of people were involuntarily exploited along with the land as Americans advanced along the Boone's Lake Road. The first was displayed 
displaced uh, en masse, and second, the second group was worked in bondage. And any of us that dig into this history have to be acutely aware the records we do have seldom mention these people as individuals or even as groups. At the time of the Louisiana Purchase, uh, land between the Mississippi River and the Rocky Mountains was home to and claimed by various Native American tribes, despite the earlier claim of sovereignty by France and Spain. Some of them had already been pushed out of their uh, lands east of the Mississippi uh, when those were settled. The primary Native American tribes living in central and eastern Missouri in the early 1800s were the Oto, Missouri, the Sac and Fox, the Iowas, and the Osage. This slide by Greg Olson shows the best estimates even earlier of the time at, uh, at the time of first European contact. And I've just shown Boone County there in the center just as a reference point. These tribes and others were immediately affected by the opening of Louisiana. By 1820, most of them had been pushed out of Missouri Territory, with the remaining ones generally passive in the face of overwhelming numbers. This slide shows, again by Greg Olson, shows uh, a breakdown of the number of treaties and sessions that were, uh, uh, took place in, in the state of Missouri. Greg, Greg is about to come out with a book, or working on a book, to go into detail on all the treaties and the changes in treaties that occurred here in the state of Missouri. Even before the Missouri Compromise of 1820, slavery was well established in most of the settled parts of Missouri. Slaves were brought in largely from Kentucky, Tennessee, and Virginia. Daniel Boone himself had slaves, as did son Nathan and most of the wealthy landowners of the Boone's Lake country. Howard, Boone, and Callaway counties at the center of the Boone's Lake region had slave populations of between 12 and 15 percent by 1820. By 1830, the same counties all reported 22 percent or more of their population enslaved. Percentages were even higher at the dawn of the Civil War, as you see here in this graphic from Russell Gerlach. Slave labor propelled the economic growth and increased the attractiveness of this region, and we must not uh, forget that. While their stories are often ignored and not recorded, the extreme sacrifices and major contributions of both Native Americans and slaves, African Americans, are critical elements in the history of the Booms Lake Road. The Booms Lake Road ended up being defined by most observers, or is defined by most observers now anyway, as the road from St. Charles to the area around Booms Lake later more narrowly concluding at the boom town of Franklin in, in uh, southern Howard County. When the, roads were, uh, when the road was first established, there were no towns on it once you left St. Charles until you got to Franklin. The only stops there were tavern or stage stops, such as those mentioned in the two gazetteers. There were no towns. I'd like to give a sense of sampling a few of these stops uh, on a tour of some select sites on that original or that Alpha Booms Lake Road. And those include a little bit about St. Charles. I'll touch on Luder Lick and Van Bibbers. Um, uh, Van Bibbers was at Luder Lick. Uh, Fruits, uh, named after a family that was there later, uh, what we call Williamsburg. Uh, Hinksons, Grams, and Thralls, and the Lexington Post Office are all in Boone County and then, of course, Franklin. So I just want to touch on some of these to give a little feel for what we were, uh, for these areas. But before I do that, I want to explain why I say that the Booms Lake Road started in uh, St. Charles and not St. Louis. 
since some of you may be aware there are two uh, DAR markers in St. Louis that suggest something different. One that was originally a 7th and Market was relocated to across from the old courthouse. And there's another one actually across the river uh, from St. Charles. But there are several reasons why uh, St. Charles really deserves the, uh, the uh, recognition as, as the start of the Booms Lake Road. The road to St. Charles from St. Louis was well established by the 1770s when St. Charles came into place, 30 years before the Booms Lake was even known about. There was a St. Charles administrative district that, uh, that was north of the uh, Missouri River uh, from, the, from the Spanish regi regime, and that was even continued after the U.S. purchase of the Louisiana Territory, uh, a district north of the river headquartered in St. In, uh, Charles. The Boone family itself uh, lived southwest of St. Charles and had many direct ties to St. Charles. Daniel Boone was appointed a syndic, uh, sort of a low-level judge, in the St. Charles District in 1800 to, from 1800 to 1804. James Mackay became St. Charles District Commandant in 1802. I spoke about Mackay, and I'll touch on him a little bit later. Nathan Boone uh, discovered Mackay's Lick in 1804 and went on to uh, begin the operation in 1805. To do that, he negotiated with James Mackay um, there in St. Charles. And he also teamed up with James Morrison. James Morrison was a critical St. Charles businessman, critical for marketing the Boons Lake Salt. St. Louis was certainly the uh, territory's first capital, but St. Charles went on to be the state's first capital from 1821 to 1826. And lastly, I'll point out that William Becknell himself, the famed uh, originator or, or founder, if you will, of the Santa Fe Trail, Becknell himself lived in St. Charles from about 1810 to 1811 and then moved on to Franklin in, in 1817. So for all these reasons, uh, I think it's best to uh, uh, not accept the claim that it started in St. Louis and uh, uh, realize that a better starting point is St. Charles. Some stops, other stops along the way, Van Bibber's Tavern. The Boonslick Road accommodated all sorts of interesting people and events. And, one of the most renowned uh, people out along the road was Isaac Van Bibber. Van Bibbers was located at Luter Lick, or what is now called Mineola, in Montgomery County. If you're on I-70, heading west, uh, maybe 70 miles or so west of St. Charles, you have to get off a little to go through Mineola in the old site of Van Bibbers Tavern. Isaac Van Bibber married Elizabeth Hayes, who was one of Daniel Boone's granddaughters. Walter Stevens, in a Missouri Historical Review article called The Missouri Tavern, published in 1921, retells a popular story about uh, Isaac Van Bibber and his hotel that brings this stop uh, a little bit more to life. In the interest of time, I will not tell it in detail except to say it involved Van Bibber's belief in the transmigration of souls, a theory that every 6,000 years completed another cycle of life, and the attempt by some Kentuckians to take advantage of that belief. You can find it in our research library that I'll go into uh, later. In the 18 teens, the U.S. government surveyors moved in to do their work west of the Mississippi uh, so that land could ultimately be sold to individuals. By 1816, a team led by William Rector was working near Luderlick or Van Bibbers. 
Fortunately for us, their precise work notes have been preserved. Here we see one page from the notes made by Rector's team as they worked in the area. Notice that they documented the precise point where they crossed the Boone's Lake Road. And they did the same in other nearby places. This is yet another example of our own state archives, uh, the, of the value of our own state archives in making these kinds of documents available to all of us. I realize you won't be able to see uh, all the detail on this, but the surveyors mentioned the Boone's Lake Road in 15 or 16 different places near Luder Lick. And thanks to their precision, because they were marking things exactly, we can now plot these points accurately. I've shown here on a present day topo map uh, that they followed very closely the modern day roads down and up from Mineola in some places being exactly on the current road. In others, they were off just a short distance. And if you walk into the woods southeast of the road uh, east of Mineola, you can still see some of the ruts from the original road, proving uh, also the validity of the data. Our present road, of course, had some technical capabilities to improve on the earlier route. But these are uh, contemporary 1815, 1816 documentation of the exact route of the Boone's Lake Road in that particular area of the state. I'd like to focus a bit now on the west end of the road and the branching point at what is now Williamsburg, or originally called Fruits, or referred to as Fruits after a family that settled there. The earliest route of the Booms Lake Road is shown here in red, and it veered northwest after passing Fruits. Up through about 1822, that route was the main through route until Columbia became the county seat of Boone County. In a short time, the main highway was literally rerouted through the new county seat on what I refer to as the beta version of this road, shown here in blue. This uh, blue route became prominent at that point until about 1826 when Fulton became the county seat of Callaway, at which time that road was again rerouted to now go through both Fulton and Columbia on what I refer to as the Gamma Route. In both cases, the branching point was just a bit west of Fruits, or what we later called Williamsburg. While I've shown the beta and the gamma variations that occurred on the western end of the road, I want to stick with the alpha route to add some more early color to the picture uh, of the road. The stories of the beta and the gamma versions of the road uh, could be yet another talk. One of the most fascinating resources we have of these early times uh, is a published journal of John, uh, of John Mason Peck. Uh, who was a Baptist minister, and he was traveling the Booms Lake Road in 1818. Um, and here is one excerpt uh, penned that he penned on Christmas Day of 1818. Um, I won't read it uh, in its entirety, but again, you have access to it on the website uh, and later through our library. Uh, it's an amazing uh, uh, tale of his encounter with a Mr. H. And when you follow the places that he mentions before and after Mr. H, it becomes clear that uh, Reverend Peck was referring to Robert Hinkson. Hinkson was an early squatter on the Boone's Lake Road in uh, uh, north uh, central uh, Boone County, where it crossed the creek. Uh, given uh, Hinkson's Creek, it's now called, in, in Boone County. Now, I'm going to read the line that says, uh, I'm going to read a couple of lines here uh, where he talks about uh, Mr. H, and particularly Mr. H's wife, where he said of the wife, the corn dodgers that, the, that she, he had were cold and quite unpalatable. 
for the good woman had never learned the art of cookery. Uh, it was a little more complimentary of uh, Mr. H himself. But what became clear was that uh, the Reverend Peck, who was using a convention, used a convention at that time uh, because he didn't want to offend Mr. Hinkson, although I should point out that by the time Peck uh, published his journal, Mr. Hinkson was dead. In any case, I love the insight into the times. I love the description of the cabin and, and Hinkson and, and Hinkson's wife. It gives you a little bit of a glimpse into that road and those conditions in that time. This slide uh, zooms in on a section of, the top, of a topo map that shows two short visible sections of the road and the likely route to and from other known points on either side. This was just a map that uh, I created when I was doing detailed work on, on the route. But I wanted to show it as a reminder that a rough approximation of the original Boone's Lake Road could be made by plotting New Madrid surveys in the central and the western parts of the road particularly. You may remember that the New Madrid earthquakes occurred in 1811 and 1812, and uh, one consequence of the devastation that was mostly in southeast Missouri was uh, the granting of New Madrid certificates to those who had had their lands badly damaged or, or destroyed from the earthquakes. Those certificates could be claimed in other parts of the territory, and if they were surveyed, they could become compensation for the losses that people incurred. As unfortunately is often the case, uh, there was a lot of corruption around this program, but many New Madrid surveys were made along the main highway of the time, namely the Boone's Lake Road. In John Graham's case, uh, I found a short swale that was yet visible, is yet visible, and then realized I had an answer to the question of why he had made his claim in a unique diamond orientation. He decided to rotate a normal north-south square claim 45 degrees, which I realized was an excellent way to maximize the length of the main road that he could capture with a square parcel. It ran so it ran due east and west uh, through the center points or through the edges of, the, of that diamond-shaped piece. A bit further we, uh, east, or I'm sorry, west, but still in Boone County, uh, you see the best preserved section of the Alpha Boone's Lake Road along the entire route. This is a section a little over a half mile long that has been surveyed and formally conveyed by the estate of Don Sanders and his family to the citizens of Boone County. We hope someday to be able to make this stretch accessible to the public, possibly as a neighborhood park. The stretch did stay in local use as a, or in use as a local road into the late 1800s, but it's just an amazing uh, uh, piece, the best one in, in 160 miles or so of that road. Just a few miles uh, farther west, but also still in Boone County, right before crossing into Howard County. We're now at the site of Thrall's Tavern on what originally was called Thrall's Prairie, about four miles northeast of Roachport. I put up this sign for a while in 2005 when we were conducting archaeological digs in the area, thanks to wonderful support of the Bill and Judy Hefferman family, on whose land this uh, site is located. <clears throat> the Lexington scene here refers to Boone County's first post office run by a later Columbia merchant Oliver Parker, uh, not to the uh, present day Lexington that some of you may be familiar with in uh, Lafayette County. The post office itself was likely run out of a corner of Thrall's Tavern. This, by the way, is what it looked like before we started the excavation. 
this is my uh, partner in crime in this, uh, Earl Lubensky, Dr. Earl Lubensky, at the well site, one of several such sites that we excavated that first year. Um, this is also likely where the Lexington Post Office was. In uh, later excavations, uh, we also located a nearby blacksmith shop. So the Lexington, however, that we were exploring in those years from 2005 to 2007 is long extinct. Now, I've mentioned several times that the uh, importance of Franklin, old Franklin, or originally just Franklin, was laid out in 1816, and it quickly became the seat of government of the huge Howard County that occupied much of the northwest uh, quarter of the state of Missouri. And it soon boomed to s between 600 and 1,000 people in population, depending on your source. The residents of Franklin <clears throat> included well-educated, well-heeled people, lawyers, artists, doctors, merchants, such people as artists George Caleb Bingham, the famous Christopher Kit Car Carson lived there. The downfall of Franklin was its location on the banks of the Missouri River. In its uh, first decade, it saw the full power of the spring floods of the river and was forced to start relocating to higher ground. More recently, that land is reaccreted uh, basically where the original Franklin was uh, under current river management guidelines. And we can actually locate the center of the old town that drove the boom. Uh, if you visit this site just immediately across the river from Boonville, uh, you can actually see a flagpole planted out in the field that uh, shows uh, the uh, center of the original town of Franklin. I guess it's on land that wasn't there originally because the river washed it away originally and then, then it was built back. Franklin itself is probably most noted uh, as a departure point for William Becknell's famous eight, September of 1821 uh, trip to Santa Fe. But just as old Franklin is thought of as the usual start of the Santa Fe Trail, it's often thought of as the western terminus of the Boonslick Road. I would argue that's not strictly true, as the Boonslick Road extended well past Franklin originally to the Boonslick and as early as 1808 to Fort Osage. But the current shorthand convention is to use old Franklin as, the, as both the end of one road and the start of another. And this monument to William Becknell was uh, erected on the south edge of New Franklin in 2013. So with all that said, whatever happened to the Boonslick Road? Why don't we see more of it now? <clears throat> Various parts uh, changed at different times over the uh, past 200 years. I would say that much of the eastern half of the road from St. Charles to around Williamsburg saw sort of the normal modernization of new highways and technologies, uh, but the general route changed relatively little in that, in that part of the state. The western route, I've discussed the changes there, those were much more dramatic because of the shifts uh, due to the formation of Boone's, uh, of Columbia as the county seat of Boone and Fulton as the county seat of Callaway County. But in some cases, even though even that original Alpha Road, we're still driving on parts of it um, as county roads. Our first modern state highways then paved over uh, much of the later Gamma Route. Uh, highway 2 evolved into U.S. Highway 40, which in turn largely evolved into Interstate 70. Uh, and it is uh, worthwhile noting that in several, in many counties, there are still uh, roads or sections of roads named Boone's Lake Road, and they generally do correspond to the original route. I want to 
to conclude with just a little bit about the Boone's Lake Road Association. We are new to the scene and we incorporated it in, in uh, 2011. Our mission is to educate ourselves and the public about this historic road and to strive for, hopefully, for ultimately, for federal recognition of the Boone's Lake Road as a national historic trail. The Missouri State Archives has been very important in our short history, not only as a source for research, but as a source of guidance and expertise. I've mentioned Lynn Morrow, a former Missouri State Archives person before. Uh, John Korosik, currently the local records director at the Archives, was on our board for a number of years. And Greg Olson, former Archives curator of exhibits, is not on our board, but he has been a key in working with me on uh, what, what we think is a fine uh, Boone County Bicentennial exhibit about travel and transportation in Boone County 200 years ago. That exhibit is at the Boone County History and Culture Center through mid-November and is brought to the public by the Boone's Lake Road Association. So lots of reasons to be grateful to the Missouri State Archives. I encourage you to check us out on the World Wide Web where we have a, a tremendous amount of information about the road. I know you can't read it now, but I wanted to show you just the home page and point out uh, there are a couple of links on there, one to the Google map that I've been referring to, and another one to a very detailed monograph that presents all the evidence behind the map. Uh, I for one believe that, the, that a map that doesn't have documentation behind it is, uh, uh, is of questionable value, and so creating this Google map challenged me to uh, uh, discuss the evidence and the, and the real detail that went into it, and that's also available there. Of course, if you chose, you could uh, become a member of the Boone's Lake Road Association and support our mission. Lastly, I want to plug the research library because this is a source of a great deal of information. We are building this online resource uh, available to everyone, members and non-members alike, to uh, be literally, we're shooting to be the world's best resource of accurate information about the Boone's Lake Road. We currently have about 170 items, many of which are available directly from the website at your fingertips. Uh, some of them through uh, links to authoritative sources like the Missouri State Archives and some, due to respecting uh, copyright, um, we simply can review the item and show the user where to obtain a copy if, if they'd like to do it, it's particularly on newer books. We have photographs, maps, uh, surveys, well-written articles, uh, databases, uh, a lot of, of information about the road that's just fun uh, to explore uh, at your leisure. We also welcome uh, contributions and, and ideas for additions to this. Uh, some of you may have uh, information that, that's not in our library now that you think is pertinent. Uh, great uh, family letters, for example, source documents, uh, wonderful articles that we haven't uh, come across yet. So um, email us if you uh, have those. I want to thank, thank you for, the, for your attention tonight on Facebook Live, and I want to thank again the Missouri State Archives for inviting me to do this. I'm happy to have some comments and take a shot at answering some questions if we've had any uh, come in. David, so far we've had three questions. Uh, the first one uh, from Linda, I didn't catch the context of it, so maybe you will understand the question. Um, she said, why not Hickam? But I don't know where in your presentation um, that you had on a slide Hickam. So, but that was her question. Um, there may have been, I'm not certain of the reference either, uh, unless the reference might be to the Hickam house in um, uh, just west of New Franklin in Howard County. Um, 
the Hickam, uh, the, the Hickam House <clears throat> is owned by the University of Missouri and is a fabulous uh, reconstruction of the, uh, or restoration of, of that house. And I forget the dates on it, but it dates from soon after the War of 1812. And we do have information about uh, an extensive article, as I recall, about the Hickam House uh, on our website. Uh, I would have to double check to see if I showed it specifically on the uh, Google map. It's uh, a little bit off of what we consider the main part of the, of the road. Even that could be questioned, but I think that may uh, be the uh, reference there. And I would uh, refer the, uh, the questioner to our website and search for Hickam. Hickam. Uh, you'll, you'll find the information there. And if there's more that we should add, uh, send us an email. We, uh, I'd love to look into it. Okay. So our second question is from Tom in Columbia. How did you locate the well site? I think that was at the, the old Lexington site. So. Yes. Uh, fortunately, the Heffernan family that owned that property, that owns that property, are, are very interested in the history of that. They knew that they had uh, an amazing piece of property, including the site of what uh, the state of Missouri designated in the 1870s as a site of the uh, state's model farm. It was a way to oh, provide recognition and a, and a boost uh, and, uh, and an example to uh, the state of the best agricultural practices of the time. So that farm itself was part of this. The Heffernans that bought this property uh, had known for a long time of that general nature, but they also learned as they worked the property that they found uh, pieces of uh, ceramics, they found um, uh, uh, brick, piece, brick pieces of brick, and other evidence of some kind of a dwelling or some kind of an occupation at one point in their field. They also uh, spoke to some of the old timers that were in the area and they spoke of a well, specifically of a well. So when we were working the archaeological site we had all that information. We knew there probably was one in the area and we were assisted by a uh, ground penetrating radar a survey that was done to help uh, pinpoint the location of it. I'm going to jump down a couple of questions because we just got a question uh, about was LIDAR used to track the, the trail? And so that ground penetrating radar, I think, is what they're re referring to there. Are there other instances you all use LIDAR to help pinpoint the trail? Well, LIDAR is not the same thing as ground penetrating radar. Okay. Uh, Ground penetrating radar is, is a tool that existed at the time we were there and 15 years ago now for uh, <clears throat> covering a wide area, uh, mapping it and finding anomalies uh, under the soil such as rocks, um, this kind of thing that might indicate something where, where you want to dig. Uh, LIDAR, as I understand it, uh, well, LIDAR has not been used uh, on, on the Boomslick Road. I w think it'd be great to be able to try it. I don't know if there are any um, inexpensive or free sources of LIDAR uh, photographs of this area. If so, I would love to hear about those. Uh, LIDAR uh, is flown from an airplane and can cover over an area and uh, detect uh, its particular I understand it's been particularly used in tropical areas where it can see through, if you will, uh, tree cover and this kind of thing and identify uh, structures and monuments that are hidden in the jungle and grown over and covered with, with vines and all that and the people on the ground don't even know it's there. So um, it'd be wonderful to be able to access that if there are uh, such uh, resources available. And I, I don't know if there are. All right, so that was Wayne White's question. Now let's go to Kerry Owens' question. Well, where did the Alpha Road cross Highway 54 south of the Vaz? And kind of the same, same general idea of a question, where did it cross the Vaz Creek? Uh, my best answer to that 
is for you to check that Google map, okay? You'll okay. be able to see our best estimate of, of those uh, actual uh, crossing points. Realize, and then look at the monograph too that accompanies that because you'll see there the data points on either side so this process basically can just, I, I mentioned the waypoints in those two gazetteers. Uh, those are extremely helpful, but in some cases they're not real precise. We, uh, myself and others, many others, uh, found other references that could add to that. And so we were able to put the dots on there and connect them. But between those dots, um, there has to be some interpretation depending on terrain and this kind of thing. So I would, rec I would recommend you check out the monograph to see the sources uh, look at the, and look at the map to see our interpretation of the likely route between those dots, if you will, that are on either side of those points. All right, I'm going to jump down to another question that's okay. similar to that one as well. Um, so Tom asks, uh, the source for the route between St. Louis and St. Charles east of the present, and he used abbreviations, but I think this is right, St. Charles Rock Road. Right. So so where would that location be, and is it the same basic answer, I guess, too? Or, or, or does the map have that much detail when you get into those urban areas? So. Uh, no, it, it has as much detail in the urban areas as anywhere else, uh, but uh, we show it starting in St. Charles, so we did not map that route out from the uh, south side of the Missouri River into St. Louis. But it, it, he, the, the questioner is correct. It did follow, the, I think, the general route. I wouldn't uh, feel competent to uh, get real precise on it because I haven't done a lot of work on it. But it did follow the general route of St. Charles Rock Road. Yeah. Okay. All right. So um, jumping back up now, Betsy Garrett asked, what was the importance um, of uh, the road to um, getting to the Oregon Trail? Of getting to the Oregon Trail. Well, the road, uh, as I say, you know, we sort of accept that in general, it, it, most, most people now say that the Boomslick Road ended up in, in southern Howard County. Uh, we have clear evidence, of course, it the, of the Nathan Boone William Clark Trek in 1808 that went on to Fort Osage, and roads don't just stop. So that uh, road continued, th those routes continued to develop on into uh, the Independence area, and it was in the Independence uh, Missouri area that the uh, Oregon and the California and the Santa Fe trails started to diverge. So uh, it was a feeder, I would say it was a feeder to uh, to all of those great western, what are referred to as the great western trails. I also have a sort of a bone, uh, while you're looking John, I also okay. have sort of a, a, a bone to pick with uh, uh, some, even, even somebody as great as National, Geogra National Geographic. I remember years ago picking up a much vaunted um, issue of National Geographic with uh, that was specializing in uh, the Great Western Migration Trails. And I, I bought a copy specially uh, to look at the map. And when I opened the map, because they always have great maps, when I opened the map up, they had this wonderful map with uh, on the uh, east that showed uh, the Mississippi River and St. Louis and St. Charles. And, and then it went clear out to the west coast and it showed all the great trails. And basically it showed everything starting at Old Franklin with the uh, Santa Fe Trail. And I thought, well, how in the heck did anybody get from St. Charles to Old Franklin? You know, they just left out in total the uh, Boonslick Road. The implication was that people did it by river, but uh, not in those early days. And, and People need to realize that in the 1820s and 30s and even into the 40s, river travel was not was not carrying a lot of traffic. Uh, certainly not not very many settlers coming into the area. So, um, so Tom asked two questions. I'll, I'll actually do the second one first because it relates to what you're just talking about. He's like, do you have a sense of how many people went by land? 
to join up with the Oregon Trail and how many went by water on the, you know, the steamboats and, and the boats on the Missouri River and so. stuff? Yeah, that would depend on the time frame. And one of the things we try to stress in uh, the work on the Boone's Lake Road is, is uh, and mapping and this kind of thing, is you, you need to accompany a, a, a route with the, with the time. And so that's why you see that alpha, beta, and gamma variation. In the early, uh, I'd say in the 1820s and well into the 1830s, uh, Virtually all of that uh, travel was overland. As ste steamboats' heyday was the 1840s, 50s, and just up to prior to the Civil War. Uh, so then you would have some more people pr uh, traveling uh, on, on steamboats. Percentage-wise, my guess is if you're looking at settlers and people actually moving into um, the western part of the United States. My guess is a steamboat still carried a fairly small percentage just because of the numbers. It was also expensive, plus you had to bring your household goods with you and uh, shipping those on steamboat in addition to all of your family would have been prohibitively expensive for a lot of people. Uh, my guess is, and again I have not researched this carefully, but my guess is that it wouldn't be unusual for a uh, uh, possibly a head of the household to go out west and, and locate property, maybe in, and maybe travel mostly on steamboat, uh, but the actual movement of the family, uh, I think most of, most of that would have been uh, by uh, overland uh, trails. Well, David, we've got one more question I'm going to ask, but I, I want to thank you before we finish uh, for giving this presentation uh, from your own board. Uh, the Friends of the Missouri State Archives Board, thank you for joining us tonight for this. Uh, the reason I saved this question also from Tom for last is he asked, and this is always the archivist's favorite question, about sources that you used uh, for your research and also sources that could be used for these other early routes like uh, the Boonswick Trail. Um, so uh, we'll end with that question. Well, that, that, that's an amazing question. Um amazingly important question and that's really what this whole effort about the Boone's Lake Road Association is is about and that's why I stressed several times sources uh, all of those sources uh, for example in that monograph where where we talk where I talk about the root the roots of the Boone's Lake Road all of those sources are detailed uh, by end notes and footnotes in that uh, rather lengthy, I think it's 50, 60 page uh, monograph there. So all of those sources are there for your looking uh, on our website by just going to that monograph. Our library itself, uh, the research library that I mentioned, is available in the left hand bar of the home page there. And again, that does not require you to be a member of the Boone's Lake Road Association. It's available to the general public. Uh, those are all uh, key sources of information. So we're all about sourcing, and we would welcome uh, ideas for things that we haven't discovered yet, which I'm quite certain are many.